You all ready to join me today in our trip to outer space? Mm. Yeah. Oh. Albert Shivers. The Matrix doesn't happen. That's very true. Come along quietly or not. They don't have to like it, but they're going to see what happens. Goodbye, wimps. And now, without further ado, from Albert Shivers. The general concept the general is that creativity flourishes, flourishes in, a, in an atmosphere of freedom. Of freedom. And now, all expecting mothers can look for new bio-infused Cocoa Puffs. Give your child the extra boost with chocolate milk. Do not take a pregnant nursing. All right, folks, welcome to the Planet Shivers podcast. I am and always will be Albert Shivers, and today I'm very excited to have on Eastern comedy offensive comedian Joe Ferreira. Thanks for doing the show. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I appreciate you coming on. What have you been up to lately? Uh, well, things are opening back up, so we're just getting our shows back moving a little bit more. Through the summer, we did keep doing so, a bunch of shows. We had regular shows. I think we did probably one a week. We're getting back to our re- regular schedule. I try and usually do at least three a month, so okay. we're getting back to that. How long has it been? How long did you guys have to stop for? Well, COVID happened. We had just started. I was probably doing it for about a year right when COVID started, mm-hmm. and... Uh, then COVID happened. I took the took a couple months off right. because at the beginning you didn't really have much of a choice, and mm-hmm. um, then we just kept going. I I did slow down because we only had like one place that wanted to it was open, mm-hmm. but he was letting us do something every month, so we just did once a month yeah. at a spot in Easton. It was fun. I mean, it's tough. You know, yeah. <laughs> it was crazy time, gotcha. but I'm glad we got to do shows. Still yeah. throughout, it was nice. People would come out. They were just glad they had something to do. Cool. Did you feel that, did the break help you at all? Yeah. Me and my girlfriend went on a fucking two, two-week road trip. Nice. Right when it, like when we decided we weren't going to be able to do shows, mm-hmm. we just went out to Colorado. We flew out to Colorado and drove around for two weeks. On a, it was like a vacation. I just needed a little break. It was good because I hadn't really taken a break from trying to get it all started. Because promoting is like... Producing shows is a little bit different than trying to be a stand-up, com- you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. And it's weird because yeah. I had to, I've only been doing comedy as like a comedian for two years. Okay. So I basically just started doing it all at once mm-hmm. and just dove headfirst in. So it was nice to have like a little break, especially That's when you didn't plan on having one. Right. You know what I mean? Right. It just like sprouted on you. It's like, all right, shut down. It's like, all right, I guess I'm going to take a vacation. I'm going to yeah. go to the mountains. <laughs> yeah, you might as well. So, for the folks who don't know who's listening, you, you, do you run the Eastern Comedy Offensive? Yeah, East, what, what East End. Eastern, East End. sorry. Yeah, no, it's cool. Um, so, it's just like, uh, what, what I'm trying to do is, in my town, there wasn't much stand-up comedy going on in Eastern Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was trying to get, you know, I was going out to Philly and Delaware doing a bunch of stuff. And I was like, why isn't there anything down here? So, I reached out to a couple comedians and they're like, yeah, let's... Come, we'll come down and put on a show. And I reached out to one, a venue that I knew of. And they were like, yeah, we'll let you do it. And that's how it started. We started doing roast battles. Okay. So I think that's you came to one of the roast battles, didn't you? I was at um, some of the open mics. Okay. Connections, yeah. yeah. And we started doing a roast battle at Connections. And our first two events, I think, were roast battles. Okay. And we just had like a, a five, five, like, it was like a bracket tournament. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like a wrestling style bracket gotcha. and we'd have them face off 10 people five rounds or five competitors and then we crowned a champion at the end of it and um it's been like that ever since you know we slowed down with the roast battles but right we've kept the shows alive cool yeah it's pretty dope yeah so how in your personal case had you what made gave you the idea to do comedy well, I always I I did theater start growing up in uh, okay from elementary started doing theater in fourth grade, and um, I always had I always liked guys like Robin Williams, you mm-hmm. know Jim Carrey. They were always my favorite, and then um, probably seventh or eighth grade I came across a George Carlin, you know, and that pretty much changed 
changed the way I looked at performing. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then in ninth grade, my dad took me to see him at the state theater. And that was like nice. official. Like I, I, always doing theater, I kind of felt like I was pointing t- myself towards wanting to do stand It was always on my radar. Like mm-hmm. I, I always want, like I'm doing theater, I'm doing these plays, but it was always just a matter of time, it felt like, before I tried to do stand up. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Carlin had a big, big impact yeah. on me too. Yeah, him. Big time. Um, I both my parents watched him religiously whenever oh, cool. I knew um, a special would come out. Mm. And for me, like just talking about when you, I seen this like behind the curtain, had this behind the curtain moment. I think in the same grade. Yeah. They brought this um, motivational speaker into my school, so I went to middle school on Staten Island and high school. Oh. Um, they bring this inspirational speaker in, and they were bringing us, you bring your class, depending on the period it was. So for whatever reason, the way my classes fell, I ended up seeing this guy twice mm. in the same day. First time I see him, he's fun, he's entertaining, cool, gets all the kids excited, fun. So I end up going back, and I don't really know what to expect, I, you know, but oh, I'm going to sit through it again, okay. Mm-hmm. And I watched him do the exact same thing, <laughs> and it blew my fucking mind. Yeah, yeah. Cause I'm like, wait, all that was just it was just his act, and I never would have known. Yeah. And that was the first time, that, like I like seeing like, oh wait a minute, you can get really good at doing something like that yeah. to the point where people don't even realize. Yeah, like even mo- I was. It's weird how motivational speakers, it's just a different type of speak. It is crazy how it resembles, in a way. You know, you're persuading an audience to listen to what you're saying. Yeah. You're trying to get them on your side. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah, George Carlin, I would say Richard Jenny was another one. Really? Yeah, I really like him. I love him too. Yeah, and he's I a classic. He, he doesn't get as much attention as I Yeah, like. he doesn't get my, any any attention. No. Um, Lenny Bruce, of course. Mm-hmm. I have like five Lenny Bruce vinyls that I have. Nice. It's, they're really cool. But him, I like him because of the freedom of speech, you know, he's the classic, yeah. you know, I think, I, I bet you if he came back now, he'd punch a couple of people in the shit, <laughs> yeah. you know what I'm yeah. saying? I, yeah. With Lenny, I think he, it, you know, that generation, it doesn't hold up. Yeah, it doesn't great. hold up. He holds up the best out of, like, because I, I went through a phase where I really got into more Saul. Yeah. And um, I can look at it from when it was done and say, okay, yeah, this is really good. But now, yeah, it doesn't. Yeah, it, I have a respect for, like, I can't play it for other my friends. Right. I could listen to it to myself. Right. But it's more of the, uh, what he did for freedom of speech that I mm-hmm. appreciate. You know what I mean? Like, get, getting arrested for saying things that were, you know, shit, taboo. You weren't yeah. supposed to talk about a lot of that shit. And he was like, no, I'm going to talk about it. And just throw me in jail after. If that's what you want, come on. Yeah. Take me off the stage, pull me on, you know. But for no, you know, I think it, was, it created what, where we are, sadly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a little yeah. bit. No, he he would have something to definitely say. He'd be baffled, you know. Oh, yeah. For well, sure. It's, it's, we are sort of going backwards, but in a different way. Yeah, in a almost. different way. Yeah. yeah. It's almost, it's weird. It's crazy to think about. Yeah. Do you, you know, how does... How does that affect... Does it affect your act? Do you let it affect your act? I try not to. I mean, people are going to like you. I, I take it as either way. Somebody's going to like you, somebody's going to hate you. Yeah. So, let, you know, there's nothing I can do about it sometimes. And sometimes you get people who whose minds, I feel like some, are made up before they come. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? When you're dealing with stuff like that, sometimes people just want to come to, you know, have something to say so that they can just be hurt. You know what I mean? So I don't know. I don't let it affect my act. I try not to uh, pull any punches. I don't do clean comedy, you know, mm-hmm. and I'm, I'm not going to start to. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a time and place. I try and read an audience, you know yeah. what I mean? But that also doesn't mean I'm not, like, if I have a set that I'm going to do, I'm going to do the set 80% of the time, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And if somebody doesn't like it, uh, there's nothing you can, you know, it's, I guess it's not their cup of tea. But the best part about the shows that I'm putting on is I'm not the le- I'm not the act, I'm just the guy bringing it. You know, right. there's five more people coming on that are really good. You know what I mean? They're they're who you're here to see. You're not here to see me. You know, when you come to an Eastern Comedy Offensive show, it's not about me. 
It's about the, the four or five other comedians that are coming down from wherever I have them coming down, sometimes New York, mm-hmm. Philadelphia. So they're coming down here, you know? They yeah. could be up in New York doing a set, practicing at the stand or some shit, you know? Right. But some of them come down and will do 25 minutes for me, you know? Out of appreciate, you know, just to come get the stage time, you know? Well, you know, tip, you got to throw everybody a couple bucks, but it's not... We're all here for the time, you know yeah. what I mean? For the, basically the love of the game. <laughs> yeah, and that's for... for anybody who's not familiar with it and you could elaborate on this is that um, for comedy if I want to learn the trumpet I could sit here and practice the trumpet yeah. and be great and never need anybody else yeah. yeah. but for a stand up you need to be in front of people. you need to be in front of an audience Yeah. yeah. you need to have a, and a variety of audiences you know what I mean because some shit may hit different mm-hmm. in front of one group where it, you know where it might hit different in front of this group yeah, some stuff I do at Steel Stacks doesn't work as good as it does, say as it as it does at like Brightside Tavern in New Jersey. You know what I mean? Just because they're a comedy crowd, some they're a, you know what I mean a stand up comedy crowd. Whereas right. at Steel Stacks, you'll have a mix of people who are a little bit more reserved. You know what I mean? So fucking dick jokes right. and talking about my asshole isn't going to fly at Steel Stacks as well as it would be at somewhere like that mm-hmm. where it usually doesn't fly anyway you know no. but you get what I'm saying I yeah. guess yeah. do you feel that your <clears throat> your getting into comedy was easier because you had an acting background were you already familiar with being in front of people oh, that's a that's a question I always think about for myself ask myself and I don't think so because I like doing theater because I, I uh it's almost fucked up to say, right? But uh, I don't like... I had a problem with myself. So when I'm doing theater, I'm not my... I'm another character. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I'm no longer Joe in that moment. But then when you're doing... When I'm doing comedy, it's authentic. I'm trying to be as authentic as I can. So I'm actually presenting a part of myself that is a little bit... You know what I mean? That I probably wouldn't... I don't necessarily want people to... You know what I mean? I'm not out there giving away my depression secrets right. my regular life you know what I mean right. but when I'm on stage talking about how I take micro doses to help with my anxiety and my depression mm-hmm. that's more that's more of myself you know what I mean that's fully me whereas playing fucking Theseus and fucking Shakespeare mm-hmm. that's just the king you know what I mean he's a king that's what I, I wish I was <laughs> you know but this is me stand up is me you know so I think it, it, it's a little bit harder to do stand up you know plus it's my material yeah you know I gotta, you gotta write your own material, you gotta, it's, it's the whole aspect, you know, mm-hmm. and then you gotta figure out the timing, you know, yeah. where the, how to say specific words, like the, the cadence of certain things, rhythm behind words, you know, that's why George Carlin was so great, he had a rhythm to the way he spoke, yeah. he chose specific words for specific moments, mm-hmm. shit like that is how you get a great comedian, you know, yeah. and that takes time, but when you're doing a play, you... I feel like a play, you don't have to... The writing is already on the wall for you. You know what I mean? You're not supposed to change what they're saying. Mm -hmm. You're just supposed to say it in a way. You know what I mean? Say it this specific way. And make sure you catch the meaning of it. You know? Or the the premise behind everything. But it's... it's, Yeah. Comedy is a different beast. I mean... It's almost not even comparable. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's completely... Other than being on stage, I don't feel like there's much the same. <laughs> yeah. I, I feel like... And the other thing I always think about is you can do a play and people will not censor a play. They'll censor a comedian. You know what I mean? Okay. Because a play could have a... You know, there's some crazy shit in certain plays. Yeah. You know? Macbeth, they murder a family. You know? They murder the kid, the wife. Um, even in, like, Fences... You know, mm-hmm. there's scenes that they have, they have, uh, I'm basically it's, there's no censorship in theater. You know what I mean? They right. get, a. Uh, that's the way the art's supposed to be, you yeah. know, but in comedy you could, you can't say that, you know? No, no. And in, in a play, this might just be reiterating what you just said, yeah. but in a play, you're playing a character mm-hmm. that. The, what the character says doesn't reflect on you immediately. Mm-hmm. 
But I think now more so than in the past, an audience may not be as <clears throat> may not be as willing to accept your exaggerations, mm-hmm. and they'll just think that it's one hundred percent you. In the comedy or in the in play? comedy, yeah, yeah. Or it's That's more the so they can't divide the person from the show. Yeah, you know when whereas like like a character like uh, Angels in America had a guy played it was a real life guy named Roy Cohen who was mm-hmm. a lawyer in America and he he was very homophobic, you mm-hmm. know. I hope I'm correct, Jesus Christ. Uh, but he ended up being a homosexual. He died of AIDS. Um, but he said, he, in, in the play, he is the, I guess, the uh, what would be the antagonist. He's the, de- the you know, the bad guy, kind of. Mm-hmm. Like, constantly, you know, and everybody, but he's a closeted homosexual. Comes out, it comes out that he is. But, like, a character like that needs to be ruthless. You know what I mean? Yeah. Whereas, obviously, you hope nobody like that. Obviously, that can't go. But I'm thinking like the cancel character. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like some people would be offended by a character like that. Whereas like you're supposed to. You know what I mean? Yeah. You're supposed to. You can't tame down a character like that because it defeats the purpose of who that character is. Mm-hmm. You know. Whereas like even if somebody's doing something, saying something in comedy as comedy, you know that's not generally what they mean. But like you can't say that. But I'm trying to prove a point. You know what I yeah. mean? Where the point could get missed just because you say something somebody doesn't agree with. Mm-hmm. Whereas in a play, you could have a character that that's the point of them. They're the antagonist. They're supposed to create the conflict. You're not supposed to agree with them, you know? Right. It's different in comedy. Yeah. You can't have... I guess you can't have an antagonist and a protagonist. <laughs> you don't want that. You just want a protagonist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so your, your writing process... How much of it happens off stage as opposed to on stage? Almost. Uh, I try. I'm. I'm still new to this mm-hmm. whole. You know what I mean? Like so. It's like I'm still learning how to. I'm still creating my own writing problem for myself and mm-hmm. seeing how other people do it and listening to you know. I listen to podcasts and see what people. You know what I mean? Right. Sometimes I pick up things, but mostly writing. Yeah. I I don't do. I try and go up there with a format of how I'm going to do my sets. Mm -hmm. Even at open mics, you know what I mean? If I have jokes that I'm working on, I usually have them written down before I go up there. With like at least a concept and a bait, you know what I mean? Like a couple pinpoints, like this is what I'm going for, point, 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 three points, you know? And uh, that's usually how I do it. Sometimes I'll go up there and just do old material but I have to have it memorized you know yeah. memorization but I do do I don't do like a I still am new to crowd work and shit like that gotcha. so I don't do much much of that uh, mm. it's definitely something I need to start doing more of you know especially hosting events like that it definitely is something I'm I do have to do I have to do Mm-hmm. But I feel like I, I wish I did more of it instead of jumping straight into material. But I usually just go straight into material. I write gotcha. and, um, yeah. So I usually write in the morning. That's what I do. First thing in the morning I wake up and I take two two hours or an hour to write. And then I just work out for the rest of the day. I go to a mic. Nice. Yeah. Unless I have work, you know, work. Yeah, it uh, all gets in the way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. How would you, um, now I, I understand you're new. Um, but you're in it. I mean, you're you're doing a lot. Yeah. I follow what you're doing, and it's it's awesome because for any form of the arts, if you're gonna do it, you might as well do it. Yeah. And yeah. throw yourself in. Yeah, that's the one thing. So now, I don't. Th- the average person who maybe is just who turns on HBO or now Netflix mm-hmm. for their hour long special, and they they don't really dive any deeper into comedy than that. Mm-hmm. Um, at the at the the stage that you're at now, you're putting together your own events. You're doing open mics. You're doing more local sh- type shows. Mm-hmm. Um, for the person who might not know, could you talk a little bit about just the community of it? The community of stand up yeah, yeah. between the comedians. Um. It's, it's cool, man. I, you get you meet some people out there. Like I have a couple people that I'm pretty close with that I, 
you probably see regularly at some of our shows. You know, mm-hmm. Tyler Rothrock's one of my good friends. Um, always good to have a guy like him come down and do a, do a little bit of time. Um, you know, Chris Freed, who's a, a, another great comedian, uh, done network cable TV shows and shit mm-hmm. like that. Um, so it's cool to have people support that. Um, and, you know, even the comedians that we have come down from out of state, it's crazy that they're, you know, are open to coming down. It's, it's You ask them and you would think that there would be a little bit of pushback or like, you know, maybe a, the occasional dickhead that's like, yeah, I gotta get some money mm-hmm. and overcharge the fuck out of you thinking you're some, you know. But nope, I never had any... Everyone's more than gra- gracious to, hell yeah, come down. Glad you're doing it down here. Um, think, you know, somebody had to do it. You know, you get a lot of praise because there wasn't anything going on. Right. So it's like, why wasn't there anything? You know what I mean? Because Easton's a great little spot. It's right between New York, right between Philadelphia. Yeah. So you get both, you could get people coming cross, crossing over from both sides. But there was no, and there's great comedy in both those places. New Jersey, New York, we're right, right between all three. Yeah. Where some of the group best stuff comes out of. Mm-hmm. And there was nothing taking place in the area. And that's all I wanted to do, you know. That's all I'm trying to do, is right. make this scene. Maybe I'm missing, maybe I didn't see it, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But I'm trying to make it bigger, you know, expand a little bit more, you know. Yeah. Go outside, we're doing some... We have some stuff in the works at Bethlehem, in Bethlehem at the Ice House. I'm not going to be... That won't be under the Eastern Comedy Offensive stuff because it's like with another group of people, but I'm helping produce some stuff over there. So we'll start doing the Ice House in October with uh, in Bethlehem, the Ice House, right down where uh, Music Fest was happening and all that shit. Okay. Charlie Brown Ice House. That was actually supposed to start the 13th, but it got flooded. Hmm. So we're, we pushed it to October. October, I think, uh, 20th. To Wednesday. <laughs> okay. That's all I know. But yeah, I'm just, it's, you have a lot of support. The people are really good. And the restaurants, mm-hmm. you know, at first I was nervous to go to some of these places because it's like, well, what do you have to offer? You know what I mean? Like, I'm going there. Like I said, I just started doing comedy. Right. I was going on faith in myself that I'm just funny. You know what I mean? Which is like kind of like a double edged sword. It's like, you know, I'm really putting myself out there. Mm-hmm. You know? Um, but they, they, they are more than well open to do it, you know, and uh, they enjoy the shows. They say I'm putting in great events. They so I appreciate that, and they let it happen, you know. Right. So together we're making it happen between the comedians, the restaurants, and myself. It's a small network that is pushing for something, you know. It's cool to see. Yeah, and I, you know, I'm not I'm not super familiar with Easton. I'm down there. I have friends down there, so I'm mm-hmm. down there semi regularly. Yeah. And just in my short time of being in PA, I it seems to me that it's grown in the arts. Yeah. And I think I think comedy is so important, man. Yeah. yeah. Like for, like it should be right in there yeah. now more than ever. Yeah, and because it, it brings you a perspective, a different perspective and opinions that you normally wouldn't maybe hear. You know what I mean? It's a yeah. space to speak freely. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's what all comedy should be. Yeah, you know, it should, you know, that's all I'm trying to. That's my goal. You know, mm-hmm. it's to create a place where we can all come and laugh. That's it. You know? Yeah. Do you have any um, particular memorable shows? <laughs> Lafayette Bar. I mean, just because that bar is so fucking awesome, mm-hmm. you know, it's got that whole vibe. You could still smoke in it. Okay. So nice. it's got that going for yeah. it, which is like, you know, my favorite fucking thing. I'm, I'm a chain smoker, and okay. I don't drink. So going okay. to a bar, it's like, what are you, I'm either getting a Sprite or I'm fucking sitting at the bar lonely if I don't right. have a cigarette, you know? Right. So that's like, the, and that bar, the people there are fucking awesome, you know? And you get a crowd that's looking for a comedy show. Nice. Which sometimes, like, when you go to some restaurant, sometimes there will be people just wanting dinner. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And uh, they they get caught in a comedy show, right. you know, which you always, it's like, hope you're having a good, thing, yeah. you know, but if there aren't like, but I, you know, Lafayette Bar, they get, we get a crowd down there and it's got that whole old school jazz bar feel. It's dark and smoky and That's they got awesome. a great stage. They light it up and it really, 
it's a cl- it's almost a comedy club right there. That's a good spot to do shows at. Yeah, that yeah. sounds. I'm gonna have to check that place. Yeah, out. that's a good that spot. Awesome. We do a. It's almost bi monthly there. We usually do. Okay. But yeah, they're great, and they do great jazz shows too. Uh, they just had a, me and my girlfriend were just down there last week, and they do phenomenal jazz shows. Like cool. real good. We had a good time. Yeah, they just started doing them again. COVID had taken them out, and now they're yeah. back open. Nice. Yeah, COVID. I took out. Um, there was one spot in this area, and it's not even close for comedy. Um, it was it was an offshoot of a the Pocono Brewing Company called Poconuts. Okay. And um, COVID took them out, and I've been trying to. Um, are you familiar with Tony Viagra? Yeah. So I was trying to get him a spot at this place. Because he's like, I want to play Stroudsburg. And you live there. And I was like, all right, I, I'll call them and I'll see if they have an opening. And um, I think they just, they closed for COVID and just never, oh, never opened back up. Yeah. I don't know how well they were doing before COVID. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it might have just been a blessing for them. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering when, we haven't seen anything like that really in town, in Easton. Mm-hmm. But I'm wondering if it's going to happen. You know what right. I mean? I'm sure somebody will have to. Yeah. <laughs> somebody will eat shit. Yeah, <laughs> right. Right. Um, Tony Viagra, how's that guy doing? <laughs> He's doing good. He was on the show a couple of weeks ago. Um, it was an explosive show. I'm <laughs> glad that I'm gl- thrilled that we did it. Um, we did it over um, over Zoom because he couldn't make it up here, and that almost just made it better somehow. And like, I, I try to always keep the ball rolling in the podcast, yeah. not there not be too much dead air. I treat it as if it's live. Yeah. It's not, but I treat it as if it is. Yeah. And um, I some of the jokes like I'd heard before, but when he would deliver the punchline, he would get right up to his camera. So all you <laughs> had was his nose, the glasses, and like the brim of his 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 his, um, his hat. And it would just crack me up, even though I had heard the jokes, and it would just kill me. So there's all, like, I had to cut out all this dead air yeah. of me just cracking up. But yeah, no, he's doing good. He's, um, Sorry. he and I are trying to put together, um, he's been writing, uh, like, adult greeting cards. <laughs> and I'm gonna, we're trying to work something out where I illustrate them. Oh, nice. So that'll be cool. If we can get that rolling. Adult greeting cards. He's reached out to him. I get to reach out to him. He's funny. Mm-hmm. I like that guy. Yeah, and he, th- he, I appreciate how much he throws himself into it. Yeah. Like that, he's, I yeah, he's full, he's 100%. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's what, he, that's what I like. Yeah. So, I, you mentioned it before, um, we don't, we don't have to go into it if we don't want to, but it's curious to me, because I've been looking into it as microdosing. Ah. Uh. So... You say you do it for anxiety. Yeah, I just do. <laughs> I, so I used to drink a lot. Okay. And I got in a bunch of trouble. I got two DUIs. And then um, I, I basically struggled a little bit with some alcohol problems. Mm-hmm. And um, through some large doses of mushrooms, mm-hmm. uh, I fucking got sober. Yeah, I've been sober now five years. I don't drink. I'm sober, not clean though. Still, still do drugs. Yeah. <laughs> you know, drugs is in nobody's mu- No <laughs> drugs is in mushrooms and fucking eating a tab of acid, right? Um, and smoking a lot of chronic. But other than that, yeah, the the microdoses came. Uh, when I got sober, I was like in a weird spot after a while, where I just wasn't. One one thing that happened when I got I got real like in reserve. You know what I mean? So I stopped like going out because obviously. If I'm going to get sober, I don't need, you know what I mean? Oh, i got to yeah. avoid the situations that put me yeah. wanting to drink. So I stopped going out. But then, you know, two years later, I went by and I fucking kind of wasn't, like, ever leaving my house. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And I was, like, getting depressed. I fucking, you know, wasn't wasn't getting no pussy. <laughs> it was a big thing for a right. guy uh, mm-hmm. that could play a huge role in your depression if you're not getting no box. Right. And uh, I fucking... I started taking my, like, uh, for, I took, like, fucking an eighth, you know? Mm-hmm. And I was like, all right. Um, then I read uh, Michael Pollan. I think okay, it was I'm called uh, Michael Pollan. Uh, what the fuck? Uh, 
Michael Pollan. Oh, wow, how am I forgetting the name of this Bible? Um, ways to Change Your Mind. Okay. And this was probably like maybe like three years ago. And um, I started, really, you know, microdosing from there. And it really does help, you know. I still take them three years later. And I actually, th- I think it just helps you focus. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It helps you buckle, buckle in and focus on the task at hand for me. For me. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Um, instead of like, i got to do this, this, this. No, you got to do one fucking thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Instead of trying to do fucking nine things and not getting any of them done, it gives me the ability to fucking go and do this one thing good. You know what I mean? So I like them for that. But it did help with depression. Um, we're, that's what we are talking about, right? Earlier, yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it, you know, it made me want to reconnect with people. You know? And I, I guess those aren't microdoses. Those are a little bit more than microdoses. Okay. I guess microdoses would be like anything... Um, like under a point oh three, I guess they would say. Okay. I don't fucking know. You're gonna get a podcast full of misinformation <laughs> from me on my. Fine, we'll, we'll put a bumper at the yeah, beginning. Yeah, misinformation. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. but uh, f- fucking uh, like on a regular, like I ate a microdose before I came here. You know, mm-hmm. I, mean, I ate one like a vitamin in the morning. Okay. You know, and like I'll I'll probably eat. I don't do them. I try not to do them every day, just because you go grow up pretty quick. Uh, like tolerance. tolerance. Um, okay. So, you know, I'll, sometimes if I eat them three days in a row, I won't eat one for like two days. Hmm. Sometimes I, I'll just eat like a gram and not eat anything for like a week, you know. Wow. Or two weeks, three weeks, you know. Okay. But the, I, I just, even, I don't know, it depends on your perspective. It does, mushrooms do work very well for a, a variety of ailments, but, mm-hmm. you know, that uh, I was on pharmaceuticals for a long time. So okay. I had... A history of like anxiety and depression before I started taking micro doses. Gotcha. Um, I just you know found that through exercise and this that I was better off. Mm-hmm. I feel like I'm about to become Joe Rogan to these whoever hears <laughs> this. Know, gonna be like, who is this motherfucker <laughs> and why is he saying? It's that? my plan the yeah, whole time. No, no uh, it sucks because now that's all cool. But I fucking in high school I was in a lot of trouble mm-hmm. and. Uh, Actually, that's when I first came across my first, like, fucking psychedelic book was when I was, like, 14. It was about MK Ultra, and I read about this one section of the book. It had this part about how they cured 500 people of alcohol and heroin addiction right. with the use of LSD. Mm-hmm. It was a, I think it was a spot in New Jersey, probably, like, Patterson, New Jersey or some shit. Mm-hmm. But they ended those trials, you know. And that always stuck in the back of my head for a real long time, especially when I went through... In high school, I would get in trouble. I'd get put in the hospital all the time. I probably did six times in the mental hospital for like anxiety and depression. Okay. Um, but I was always on medication. So that's what uh, it never worked, you know. And then one time I got out of the hospital. I changed. I literally I could remember it. I texted my brother. I had started working out a little bit in the hospital, and I texted him, and uh, he gave me a diet plan, okay. and I changed my whole diet. I was. You know, it was probably two, I don't even know what year it was, fuck the year. Mm -hmm. But I changed my whole diet, and um, I started working out regularly. And I would still, but this is the thing, I still dabbled in drugs, you know what I mean? Um, Not recreationally, like a fucking Mm -hmm. illicit user, you know what I mean? Um, And not even like an adult using, I was just like a kid illicitly using drugs, you know what I mean? Um... But I got a diet. I started working out. And then finally, I, I kicked some of those drug habits. And I went back and forth between drinking and smoking. I was on parole. Okay. Um, and when I couldn't smoke, that's when I started drinking, like, a lot. And um, it was just leading back to getting my... I was probably going to get my third DUI. Hmm. Which is, like, tough because I'm not, I'm not fucking state prison tough. You know <laughs> what I mean? <laughs> um... And then we fuck it. I was like, you know, I got to fucking figure something. I got to do something. And I was like kind of depressed all the time with like battling. Not, I knew I had a drinking problem and I couldn't. I would go eight months sober and then I relapse. And I'd go nine months and relapse. Six months, relapse. Um, 
and then finally I made it I made it a year uh, I made it eight months and I had I got fucking hammered and then like that was like the summer I was like doing real good tripping I was t- taking kind of larger doses of mushrooms and um I made um I made it eight months that summer and then like ju- I was the last day of music fest and I went to the bar with some of my friends and I got fucking one o'clock last call I mm-hmm. fucking took three shots and drank three beers at the last call I made it all night <laughs> and I uh, fucking went back to my boy's house and I fucking took my first dab and I fucking passed out in the yard and my dad came picked me up and I've been sober ever since wow. <laughs> haven't had a drink since but yeah it was fucking what were we talking about microdosing microdosing uh, yeah that was the when it all started that's when I found the effectiveness of it you know what I mean better than any prescription any prescription drug. drugs yeah, yeah. Yeah, between exercise, a good, I exercised, when I first started, like, when I was, like, my most anti-alcohol, because this is the other thing, is, like, I had to change the way my brain looked at alcohol. I treated it like it burned the fuck out of me, you know what I mean? Like, I was angry at it. <laughs> like, it's weird, you know what I mean? But I, I just was like, nah, I don't fucking drink anymore. I don't fucking drink. People ask me if I wanted to go out, shut the fuck up, you know what I mean? Like, an attitude about it. Um... But it helped me stay sober. You know what I mean? It helped me because it was like, it was almost like also I took a, it was conform, it was like a conformist drug. You know what I mean? Like it's so popularized in culture, right? And so then I started thinking to myself, like, I fucking hate a lot of shit like that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, so why, why am I doing this? Yeah. If all these people are doing it and I hate all these fucking people. (laughs) Right? Mm-hmm. Why am I fucking doing this? Right. I don't even like... I don't like alcohol or the people that it's involved with. Mm-hmm. Why am I doing this? You know? And I fucking quit drinking. And I started... I actually started smoking weed again, too. I was on parole, but I told her I moved away. <laughs> I told her I moved to Philadelphia because I'd been taking piss tests for a fucking every day for a year. Wow. That's why I couldn't smoke anymore. Yeah. But, and, but, but in between then, I don't know, man. I, my drinking just went up. One hundred fucking fifty percent. I substituted it out, you know. Right. Which is even crazier. That's where you know, because alcohol is like could kill you, kill a motherfucker. Yeah. I don't. I, I I would shake the motherfucker's hand who overdosed from marijuana. Like good for yeah. you, buddy. <laughs> you know. Yeah, I, I once looked it up, and it, it's an obscene yeah, you need amount. You to smoke like it's, three times your obs- body weight or some yeah, shit. Yeah, it's insane the amount it would take yeah. to kill you. I said I've ate. I ate like fucking. The one night I ate, you know, over fucking fifteen hundred milligrams of edibles. Wow, okay. That's a lot of edibles. Yeah. I fucking, <laughs> I was smack, but I wasn't yeah. gonna die. Yeah. <laughs> I, was, I wasn't even. I had a great time. <laughs> Best yeah. night of my life. <laughs> you know. But yeah, I I think a little a little bit of alcohol and some mushrooms would take the world on a whole different route. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I started. Um dipping my feet in microdosing and um, marijuana I went through a very bad period of Lyme's disease oh shit real bad yeah and um, the typical case you know no one can really diagnose it right yeah it's a, it's a slippery disease yeah and um, I ended up with a buddy of mine kept telling me go to my doctor go to my doctor go to my doctor and I was like eh maybe okay eh. Because he was this hillbilly podunk doctor. Yeah. In, um, he probably knew you had Lyme's disease, though, as soon as he saw you. Seriously, <laughs> same He just, he, he was, like, just hard-ass. This guy was um, a doctor for the WWF. Oh, fuck. So I go into his office, and the, the waiting room hasn't been updated since 1982. So it's got, like, Wood paneling. No, it's, yeah. it's got the bushwhackers, the yeah. Legion of Doom. Well, wait. <laughs> <laughs> the, when you get called back into his office, so the nurse calls you, okay, you can go into room two or three or whatever. The whole hallway is full of signed The Rock, Stone Cold, Generation X, all these signs, Dr. Frank, thanks, Dr. Frank. And as I'm going, <laughs> I walk past, there's an Owen Hart. Oh, and shit. I'm like, jeez, okay, this guy's for real. And he came in and took took care of me good, yeah. you know, from 
because I had like um, headache problems. He just he just cleared everything out. And once I started, you know, to recover from it, because I couldn't walk, like it was it was real bad. Yeah. And I started doing, um, started getting marijuana from friends, just to see if it would help. Because I'd always been pretty straight, not yeah. in a in a resentful way. Yeah. But I was just concentrated on what I was doing. Yeah. I didn't you took a smarter to approach than I did. So <laughs> I'll admit, as a user, shouldn't, well, <laughs> shouldn't start using it before your brain's developed. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think I, mean, I was turned off to it young. Um. This is a story for another time. My mother, um, my parents divorced. My mother's boyfriend was a hell's angel. Right. So there was all the awful things around me all the time. Yeah, yeah. So it wasn't a big deal. It wasn't attractive to me because there it was. Yeah. And I didn't, I was a soft, quiet kid who would watch these brutes. I mean, they were, they were fine guys. But they were the opposite of what I was. Yeah, and yeah. I was like, okay, well, they're acting like this. I don't want to act like that. And with a diet change mm-hmm. and some of that extracurricular is just, yeah. you know, I feel feel completely normal. Yeah. I think it's a huge thing. Yeah. That, that it is a, you know, I don't like to talk about it anymore because it's over. It's a real popularized theory now. But it, it really yeah. is probably the most important thing is your diet and the... The way you're, you take care of your body. Coming from a chain smoker, I fucking, you know, <laughs> I'm a walking starburst contradiction. Um, right, but at least you know, yeah, you know what you're doing. But yeah, yeah. I know you're to aware. an extent, you know, yeah, how to make myself feel good, you know. Yeah, so yeah what, fit, fitness. Yeah. No, no, no that, that's important too. Uh, let's jump back to comedy real quick. I'm curious, um, <clears throat> we were talking about Carl before. <clears throat> and I'm always fascinated with his eras. Mm-hmm. Um, he's done the most HBO specials of any comedy mm-hmm. comedian, partially out of necessity. But um, do you have a favorite special or a favorite era? Oh, I always like the jokes about. One, I can tell you my favorite bits okay. is uh, saving the planet. Yeah. How that's a bunch of bullshit. That's mm-hmm. a great bit. Yeah. Um, the one of the first the the first joke that ever he did that stood out in my head that made me love him was probably a guy's named Todd. Okay. I remember that. Like I don't know why. I still remember it. It's probably even if I probably listen to it now, I probably wouldn't even think it's half as funny as I mm. used to. Right. But that joke will be like forever embedded in my brain. Um, I used to have this one record by him, and it was an Alphabets. I think it was like him doing the weather. Like a oh, weird weather. Yeah, AMFM? Yeah, yeah, something yeah. like that. So that was a good one. I liked that. Um, I mean, the guy's named Todd Bit. Um, that was the first special, Carlin special I seen. And I think before that, in that show, the joke that always sticks in my mind is he's going, he's like on a tear, and he ends the tear with. Maybe a truck full of human waste will exp- explode outside the Pokemon factory. <laughs> and I was the perfect age. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. All my peers were into Pokemon. I was like getting out of it, starting to like think I was too cool for it. Yeah. And that joke, I was like, yes, I like this guy. <laughs> so yeah. that's one that sticks in Anything he says about religion and God, because I was Catholic until I had the ability to think for myself. Yes. Yeah. Because that was very... I'm. I mean, I can remember that. I, that shit was essential to my life. <laughs> Did you yeah. do um, like catechism? Yeah, yeah. My mom was my Sunday school teacher. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, I can remember the day that I fucking started wandering. Mm-hmm. I, I'm not even kidding. It was nine eleven. It's coming up. Nine yeah. eleven, and I was like, why? <laughs> if he could stop this from happening, why yeah. didn't he? And nobody answered. I was like, what a dickhead. Yeah. You know? And then from that day on, I always wondered about God and why he hires these fucking pedophiles. But anyway. Yeah. No, my my <laughs> first questioning was also, see, I, um, my, my mother was Jewish. Yeah. My father was Catholic, and he wanted me to do all the sacraments. And I was a kid who was really into dinosaurs, and I had a catechism teacher said that tear me a new asshole because... All I was like, so where 
do the dinosaurs, because she's going through the story, and I'm like, where do the dinosaurs factor into this? Yeah. And I was young, but educated, and I knew that people and dinosaurs most likely didn't hang out together. Yeah. It wasn't a Flintstones episode, and yeah, she tore me a new one and sent me to, they weren't nuns, but they might as well have been. Oh, wow, you were a real religious. It wasn't like that at mine. Okay. My mom was my teacher. I literally asked her. I was like, why didn't God stop 9-11? Yeah. And I thought, just dead silence. Yeah. Not as, <laughs> no, not as quick as a plane. No, yeah, yeah. Not as quick as the plane was. Uh, fucking. But yeah, that was like when I realized. I was like, this guy. He's kind of a dick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and that was another Carlin bit on um, Toledo Window Box. He does a bit about how God, he wasn't totally at a point where he was just denouncing it, but he was just poking fun at it. And he was saying, how God doesn't care. He's busy throwing lightning bolts and running the universe. He doesn't care about us. That's one that always sticks out to me, too. Uh, Yeah, the recycling one, that's one, too, that sticks out. Do you think the Earth Mm -hmm. will... Gives plastic. It, the, the plastic, yeah. yeah. Because uh, the earth will make plastic part of itself. <laughs> yeah. You know? If we have plastic, don't you think that means that plastic was already here? Yeah. He's good. <laughs> he was a genius. Yeah, and I love that you bring up Richard Jenny, because I think a big steaming pile of me is yeah. one of the best That's a stand-up great, specials. It's a great special. Yep. Another bunch of shit you're probably getting a lot of trouble for talking about. Oh, yeah. You know? No, I think about I got a few of those. Just um, I was just listening to Norm Macdonald the other day. Okay, it's the San Francisco special is wild. Okay, I don't know if I've oh, heard yeah. that one. Yeah, check it. Check that out. Norm Macdonald, he's he's another one. Him. Yeah. Uh, no, and pretty much anybody nowadays. I don't think there's many comedians that would survive. Bernie Mac wouldn't make it. No. He, he used to drop the f bomb all the time. And I don't mean fuck. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, I mean Lisa Lampanelli she's gone she used to be one of my favorite female comedians mm. I don't know what happened to her you remember her? I do remember her yeah she loved black I, cock big yeah. black dicks yeah I didn't follow her <laughs> super closely but I do I have now that you bring it up I haven't yeah she was a she was a real feminist yeah yeah <laughs> um let's see yeah Richard Jenny uh Well, that whole special had the running gag the extremist. of miserable punk faggot. Make, yeah, yeah, the extremist, miserable yeah. punk, punk yeah. faggot. Yeah, miserable punk. Because I'm just saying, can't you just take the turban off for the two hours yeah. that are on the phone? Right. When you get off, you could build it. Yeah, that's classic. And the, the whole part where he's... he oh, tickles all of us nuts. Yep. <laughs> he's going back and forth on the stage, and he's picking on the right and the left. Yeah. Because there is your crew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Like yeah, left right, liberal gender swapping yeah. mm. <laughs> and then you got your right yeah that shit classic I have that saved in my phone one of the ones um, Platypus Man was good too yeah that's a good one yeah. I mean he has four good good recordings yeah Catholic Schoolboy I think the other one is called okay uh, that's another good one he's yeah, all his shit always good always good tragic the best ones. Yeah. If I can shot himself. Yeah. Yeah. Very. As far as I know, as the story goes, him and his wife woke up. She said, "I'm gonna make breakfast." She's gonna make breakfast. He said, "Okay." Be old Hunter S. Thompson. And, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that shit quick. Yeah. Hey man. No time to waste. <laughs> no. Right? No. The motherfucker didn't waste not a second. No. <laughs> Yeah, he was he was he he's a good one. I always liked uh I'm trying to fucking remember his name. I don't have many new guys I really fuck with. Mm. Patrice O'Neill. Yeah. Mean, that's another one. Yep. Classic. One of my favorites. I got really into specifically during COVID, but I hadn't been into him before. But like recently I got really into Stan Hope. Oh yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, he's playing in Boston this weekend, I think. Oh, is it? Okay. I mean, it was last weekend. Mm. I don't know. 
The guy was just down there for a show, and he was playing at the Boston Comedy Factory or some shit. Nice. And I was like, damn, I might come back. <laughs> I might come back. Yeah, he and, like, lately for me, it's been him and, and Joey Diaz. Yeah. I've been on a, a big Joey Diaz kick. I like, um, if you're familiar with it, like, he had the he had the Church of What's Happening mm-hmm. podcast with Lee, and now he has, like, a, his on new one. Joey's joint? Yeah. And it's different, but I like it. It you know feels like I'm sitting at the table with an old relative. Yeah. So I, I enjoy throwing it on when it, when it comes out. Yeah, I haven't seen that one yet. How about those fucking uh, Kate Quigley and all them folks? Did you hear about that shit? No. Were they, I guess, like four of them uh, were doing some blow and three of them died? No, I haven't Shouldn't heard laugh about into that. the microphone and say that like that? <laughs> uh, but yeah, I fucking... She's on Joey Diaz's podcast all the time. Okay. Kate Quigley, I guess. Yeah, I've heard the name. Yeah. I'm not familiar I guess with what she was at a happened. party or some shit, and they did a bunch of blow, and it was laced with fucking fentanyl. Oh, yeah. Three of the four people died, oh, and she really? was in like critical condition or some shit. Jeez. Yeah. So has she still? Is she still I, alive? I, yeah, I can't, yeah, she's alive. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. She's the only, pretty much the only one that survived. Man. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, I haven't heard about that. Yeah, that happened like last weekend or some shit. Somebody showed it to me. Oh, yeah. she was asking me about it. I was like, nah. Yeah. yeah. And then I was saying it to my parents, and my mom was saying, ah, oh, Darius Rucker's girlfriend just overdosed too. Apparently, it's the same fucking person. Okay. I was like, oh, we're talking about the same shit. It took us like 15 minutes. Mm. Realize. Wow. Yeah, it was yeah I hadn't heard about it. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah, that's tragic. It's mm. a sad one. Comedy's a crazy business, dog. Don't yeah. Yeah, it's I I would say I don't think it's a popular opinion, but I think it's the hardest of the arts. And it's uh, yeah, for sure. I've done a couple different fucking I've dabbled in the arts. I like to think I have mm-hmm. pretty much my, my almost my whole life and it's the most fun. It's the most torturous. It's the most rewarding. I mean, and it's not, it's def- definitely the hardest. You know, a play you get, you could rehearse, as long as you got the space, you could rehearse for three hours. Yeah. Comedian doesn't have, you know, we get five minutes. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's a longer, again, I take, it takes me three times longer to get to the mic than it does to perform on the stage where the mic is. You know, you're not driving an hour and a half to right. do a five minute fucking yeah. set, yeah. you know? I'm trying to fuck, you know? Drive to Delaware, I drive fucking New York City, mm. fucking. I'll take a three hour trip for a five minute mic if I have to. Yeah. So, my last, we're just about the end of time. My last question for you is gonna be left field. Did you do a photo shoot <laughs> where you wore a raccoon thing over your junk? I did. <laughs> I probably did. So, for, for I had, um, an art show with a couple other people. There's a, there's a new art gallery down the block from here. <laughs> and um, the girl who did the pictures, um, Jillian Gallardi, I, th- I think that's her, the right name. And um, that was one of the one of the pictures. Was it a, f- a film? No, it was a, f- it's a photo. A photo, yeah. And it was just like neck down. Yeah. And um, somewhere, like I would sit, I partially worked at this place. And um, well, I'm, I had like a four-hour shift there just in case anybody came in. And, you know, you could sit there for four hours and you yeah. could do the generic, hey, come visit me down at the Korean VR Gallery. Yeah. But every day I'd come up with a new shtick. And um, I would bring like action figures there and have them tour the gallery and all this ridiculous stuff. And um, one day I was just taking pictures using the reflection and putting myself in all the artwork. So somewhere on Facebook is floating around my hand coming Grab reflecting, my yeah, right. coming from off the thing, and I was talking to the, the the girl about it, and she goes, "Oh yeah, that's so and so," and I was like, "I don't know if it's the same, <laughs> but I'm gonna ask him when I see." Him. Yeah, there's probably there's a couple of Joe Ferraris, but I don't know how how many of them hold raccoons on their penises and fucking let people take pictures. Yeah, you're <laughs> you, you, you're the only you born that much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think so. Yeah, not too many of them. That's how I got over my... Uh, I started doing that to get over stage fright. That's why I started okay. naked... 
<laughs> I was getting a little bit too nervous, so I was yeah. like, you know what will make you not nervous. Yeah. Well, that takes the picturing everybody in their underwear yeah, yeah, to yeah. the next, That's the next yeah, level. Deal. Yeah, and it pays you good. And then I started okay. getting the money for it, and I was like, yeah, nice. fuck the nerves. <laughs> yeah. You're going to make you money. <laughs> no, that's awesome. Yeah, it's fun. It's cool. a good time. And you get to sleep while you work. It's a fucking amazing job. You got to sleep while you work? Yeah. Like, yeah. How does that work? They just let me fall asleep. <laughs> Pick a position. <laughs> nice. I just fall the fuck asleep. I'll lay down. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. Well, I'll squeeze it in when you can. Squeeze it in, yeah. Squeeze the na- naps in when you get them. Nice. Paid to sleep? Okay. Did you paint all these hours? Uh, yeah. Those two, I mean, this is a poster. Yeah. I but those two, yeah. It's uh, impressive. Thank you. That's a painting? With a picture in it? This, that is um, pen and ink with a picture in it. Okay. And yeah, this is pen and ink. Yeah, see, that's mm. dope. Thank you. Look yeah, that is um, Dorothy Donegan. She was a jazz piano player uh-huh. in the 40s. Oh, wow, dude, you would really get a kick out of the Lafayette Bar. We're going to have to go down there. You yeah, next, shit like that. It has a whole feel to it. Okay, like no, a real yeah, fucking swing. The, ne- swing the next time you're playing there, I'll come yeah. check it out. Yeah, come, come dude. See. Go on. A, you know, honestly, you like jazz? They have I really am. good jazz bands, like fucking Stevie Wonder, fucking bassist and shit like that. Wow, like, okay. Uh, motherfuckers that played in those bands, they're fucking good. Like real fucking fire. Me and my girl be going in there. You gotta come check it out. I have to shoot you one of their definitely things. It's dope. It's a good spot. Not just for comedy. But, yeah, definitely come to a comedy show. Yeah, no, I'd love yeah. to. But, yeah, man, um, thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, for sure. It was, it was good talking to you, getting to know you a little bit. Thank you. I've seen your work, and I've enjoyed it. Thanks. So it was, it was yes. nice to be able to talk to you. Yes, obviously, your paintings are fantastic. I appreciate thanks. you having me down here. Thanks for yeah. giving me the time. You know? Absolutely. No, we're gonna, I'm going to have you back. Thank you, for sure, man. Cool, man. Pleasure. Thanks. Peace. Thank you, everybody, for listening to the Planet Shivers podcast. It was great to have another comedian back on the show, finally. You could find this episode and all the other episodes on all major podcast platforms and YouTube with some video. Thanks again, and I'll catch you on the next episode. And in the meantime, take care of yourself and take care of somebody else.